Welcome everybody to the Nvidia Omniverse live stream. Very happy to see everybody here today. As you can see, we have some amazing guests. We're going to be talking OpenUSD, Geospatial, AEC. We have a demo pack we're going to show off. Uh, so very excited to have everybody here today. Before we introduce everybody, uh, let me just give a quick pitch for GTC, which is coming up now literally just weeks away. Uh, but very special thing uh, is an early bird discount, which expires tonight at 11.59 p.m. Pacific. So you have the rest of the day uh, to register for GTC on site at a significant discount. And you could also stack the regular discount when you go to GTC website right now uh, with any referral code that we've been posting online. If you don't see it, we'll post it in the chat in a minute, uh, but that gives you an addi additional discount. Um, that's for anyone who can, uh, who can attend on site. GTC is gonna be full of engaging sessions, lots of opportunities to chat and meet with NVIDIA developers, our partners and other people from the community who are attending. If you need any help setting up any of those meetings, please get in touch with me or someone else from the community team. Uh, Edmar at NVIDIA.com is the best way to reach me via email or hit me up on Discord. Uh, we're super excited about this. Uh, we also have just posted an announcement on the forums a few days ago, breaking down uh, sessions by topic. So we have sessions uh, uh, um, across a broad range of topics, uh, but we broke those down for you to make it really easy to set up your schedule. Just go to the forums, we'll post a link in a second, and you can check out that post. Uh, things like SDG, for example, or, or synthetic data generation. We have a whole bunch of sessions specifically on that. We have other sessions focused on developers. We have an open USD day, which is gonna have a nice, uh, nice luncheon we're planning. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. Um, if you can't come, don't worry, we got you covered. Uh, we're gonna do uh, lots of support for virtual attendees as well. Um, obviously it's not the same as being there, but uh, we're gonna do our best to, to help, help uh, support everybody who's not able to make it live because we know it's, uh, it's a long way to go for some of you. Um, uh, we have on our Discord server, we have a channel called GTC. Uh, and on there, we have some of those links. Uh, we also are going to be um, hosting, uh, most of the sessions are available virtually. And, um, and then for everyone who's registered, you'll also be able to continue to watch our sessions uh, shortly after they are, are live. Um, but just you have to make sure you register first. So a strong encourage everybody to register, whether you're going virtually or on site, try to do it today uh, to take advantage of the early bird discount if you are going to, uh, to be there uh, in San Jose. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, okay, let's get to the, the real exciting stuff for today. In addition to GTC is that we have an amazing partner here. Uh, let me stop sharing this. Um, uh, our friends from Cesium are joining us. Uh, let me see. Oh, we have also, look who, look who just popped in. There's Richard. Uh, and yeah, Shazan's yeah. also here. I see him here. Um, so Richard, we have a pretty amazing stream today. Uh, um, and we're going to talk about Cesium, but also um, as it relates to geospatial. Um, so before we uh, get into that, let's introduce everybody really quick. Uh, let me get the brand here set up uh, so everybody can see. Um, okay, so everybody knows me. Richard, you want to give yourself a little introduction? Yeah, I'm the uh, community forum manager, so I help uh, answer questions and direct people to the right uh, knowledge base, uh, mostly in the, the rendering and um, app space. Awesome. And uh, get your questions ready for Richard or anyone from the CZM team. Uh, just feel free to post in the comment section. We'll be watching those very cl uh, uh, closely. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave, how are you doing? Good, Edmar. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for coming, um, man. So tell me about yeah, your background. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Uh, so my name is Dave Bragg. I am the product manager for our Omniverse team here at Cesium. Um, I've been with Cesium for about four years now and uh, in the geospatial industry for, I'm afraid to say it, almost 30 years um, in doing uh, everything from data creation to building applications to serving that data out. And now at Cesium trying to help people connect with uh, the geospatial data in new and exciting ways. Um, and one of those ways is through Omniverse and, and some of the platforms that we'll talk about today. So happy to be here. Excited to go to my first GTC um, here coming up. Awesome. And, and we do well, so uh, thanks. That's great. So anyone out there, first of all, never be afraid to say that. Your experience is is gold, so that's awesome. Uh, so very, very uh, honored to have you joining us. Um, and if anyone who's watching and you're going to go GTC and you want to meet with Dave, get in touch with us, we'll hook you guys up. Uh, that could be fantastic. Um, and you're joined by your fellow colleague, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Emma. How are you? Good. How are you? And it is super early where you are, right? It is. It's just ticked over to 5 a.m. So oh, gosh. It's still waking up. Well, thank you for um, joining us. Yeah. Tell us a little about yourself. Yeah. So I'm a solutions architect here on the uh, Cesium for Omniverse team. I've been with Cesium for about 12 months. 
uh, prior to that, I spent most of my career in 3D visualization and interactive 3D, specifically in the AEC uh, market. So buildings, roads, rail, infrastructure projects, that sort of thing. So very, very happy to be uh, on the side of producing tools for 3D people to make awesome experiences in the sector. That's great. Well, very, very thankful you woke up early. It's a great honor to have you here as well. Um, and then we are, you also have your colleague, Sean, with us. Hey, Sean. Yep. Hey, Edgar. Or Edmar, sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, so my name is Sean Lilly. Uh, I've been with CSIM for about eight years now, and my background is all in real-time rendering. So just trying to get large data sets streaming as fast as possible. Uh, that's kind of been my focus lately with Omniverse. So I'll talk about some more of like the technicals behind how our extension works. And then Ryan will give a bunch of demos. Okay, awesome. And we have a, actually a great video to, to kind of kick things off, put things in perspective. But before we play the video, um, let's talk about the, the topic at hand with geospatial workflows. So what exactly uh, is geospatial? Who wants to take that? I guess uh, it's geospatial, right? So it's a, we always joke at home, it's like it's a map, right? So I'm bringing this geospatial content. We're going to see... A lot of times, especially in the engineering space, there's a very nice design, but it doesn't live anywhere. It lives in white space. So let's put it in context, in a real world context. Let's put it into the city, into the site that it is, and then provide that visualization of what it will actually look like in the real world. Um, so the geospatial content provides the terrain. It can provide the bathymetric information. It can provide linear data about the roads and different information around the site as well too. So it's really just providing the context around the site that you're working on. Um, and putting it in real world space. Okay, that, that's a lot of information uh, to in, in terms of data. So let's take a look at what some of that actually looks like, uh, especially when looking at how it's used in some of the great apps you've uh, you've been connecting it to. So let's let's play this. We'll be back in uh, in one minute. If we take a look at this nice sizzle reel. Amazing, uh, really good testament for uh, for how well you guys work with partners too. And uh, for those who don't remember, uh, some members of your team, I, uh, Ryan, I think you were there. Sean, were you there at the last live stream we did with uh, with Bentley? Um, that was a lot of fun. Another another great partner. But uh, but as you saw in that reel, everybody, uh, really great workflows with um, with uh, apps that you know and love, Unity and Unreal. Um, so uh, can you kind of go into a little bit about Cesium's background as a company and, and uh, what you guys kind of uh, focus on now that we kind of got a little bit of a preview? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So I, we've got here just a couple slides. So I want to kind of get to the pretty pictures and the cool stuff first. So um, and Cesium itself, um, we're, we've been around for, for a while now. So we were kind of born in 2011 uh, with inside of a, a company called AGI, which is now Ansys and then spun out in 2019. But our our real Cesium is basically building the platform to stream these global scale, massive 3D geospatial content to those applications. So Edmar, as you mentioned, you know, the ability to connect with different partners and different viewers, right? We're like to be an open ecosystem, um, open standards, open APIs, to be able to allow people to basically democratize and use this vast amount of geospatial data and bring it into um, their application of choice, their viewer choice, their environment of choice. Um, we're definitely, CZM is big into the open, um, open source market and open source kind of mindset. Um, we created a, there's a 3D tile specification um, that Cesium created. Uh, it's an OGC uh, community standard, and it's really built for streaming uh, these massive amounts of 3D content and providing level of detail. So you're not getting the entire scene. You're kind of building scenes and only bringing the tiles that, that are within side of your view, but not really bringing everything in. Um, 
We also kind of built with um, supporting a lot of the uh, um, open source, the runtime engines as well, um, and integrating with OGC, the Metaverse Standards Forum, uh, AOUSD and USD as well too. Um, and we've kind of just been building this platform called ION that allows us to bring this content together, tile it, um, and then stream it back out in a high performance way through 3D tiles into visualization engines of choice, right? So we've got, um, if you're doing it on the web, there's a CCMJS, which is an open source uh, viewer that you can build applications around. And then we also have our engines and our runtime engines uh, for Unreal and Unity uh, and Omniverse that we're streaming the content into. So uh, our platform starts with Cesium Ion, which is a SaaS or a self-hosted solution. And the power of that is our tiling pipeline. So we can bring in our 3D data, our users can bring their 3D data and upload it into Ion. We can tile it and then stream it back out in 3D tiles format to be consumed uh, on the front end by uh, these different, uh, our different plugins into the different environments um, that we work with here. So, and kind of back to your original question, like what is that 3D data and what is geospatial? Um, I think kind of give it some context, right? We've got this idea of curated global content. Um, so CZM works internally. Um, we've got CZM World Terrain, which is a global world terrain database that allowed that provides elevation information, surfaces, terrain surfaces across the entire globe. Uh, open street map or OSM buildings or building footprints, just very basic buildings if you don't have anything. Uh, it provides some nice re reference information. And then also just recently released uh, Bathy, uh, bathymetric data, so a world coverage for bathymetric data. So again, pulling in open source data, providing this content, making it accessible via cesium ion into uh, these different uh, uh, run times as well. We work with commercial data partners, um, so Google Photo Realistic 3D Tiles, P3DT, we call it internally, um, made a big splash uh, late last year when we did integration with that, so streaming. Google's massive amount of geospatial data, again, making those accessible and bringing them into uh, these different applications. Um, we work with Bing Maps, and then uh, one of our big partners is Aerometrics, which we'll highlight a little bit later uh, with inside the demo pack that Ryan's going to show as well, too. So we've got this idea of this global content that made, that's accessible, that we provide, that season unlocks for you. But then you also have the ability to bring your own data into, into this platform. Um, so whether that's point clouds generated from drone imagery, LIDAR sensors, things like that, that can build out a 3D data set, uh, 3D buildings, the reality models. We're seeing a lot of this like reality capture and drone deploy and a lot of those uh, applications that are building these high fidelity 3D models that we can now bring into ION, stream them out as 3D tiles and make them accessible to a larger community of users. Uh, vector data, we're doing things with voxels, so the cubes and time dynamic data. Um, and then we have instance models, uh, like I think that that image there is some tree data that inside of Philadelphia. So being able to kind of bring that information together. But the goal here is to bring all of that into that common platform, stream it back out, and then make it accessible um, and bring it into your, um, make, provide that reference information, just kind of bring it into, into Omniverse, for example, um, and to be able to show and take advantage of all the amazing abilities for ray tracing and the rendering and all of the lighting and all of that stuff and bring that real world instead of building worlds we already have it let's bring the real world data into those environments i love that i love that you know you had mentioned democratizing access to this data and it seems like if looking at these projects you know everything from relatively smaller ones to huge ones uh and it seems I, like what, what this really does is is allow people who've never had access to this type of data before to get started uh, and a, a much, much, uh, um, much easier way uh, than starting from scratch with stuff. So, um, so, but the fact that people can bring in their do you know, own data also is uh, is amazing. So, um, how are you finding most people are are leveraging right now? Most people, um, I would assume, they're working with the data that you guys offer, or you're seeing a lot of people are really bringing in their own data. I think it's a combination of the two, depending upon the use cases. Because as you mentioned, it can either be very small. Um, so, in the if it's a um, an architectural site where I'm working on a small building, like I really am only concerned about a very small area. I might have data that I'll, I'll have my design data. I might have, you know, pre-site data that I've, that I have available that I want to bring into it. And then the global data, the global content becomes that reference and provides that context to that small site location. Um, I think with some of the 
you know, previously before joining the Omniverse team, I was working on the smart construction industry and smart construction was doing the same thing. We're bringing this, but on a construction site in worrying about earthworks and moving the dirt around. So those were very tight site specific pieces of information, but there was a lot of, it was constantly bring your own data. So every day new data was coming into that and to be able to provide that. So it's, um, and then we have things like satellites um, and supporting satellite visualization. So in that case, the data for the globe is pretty static, it's global, but then the satellite tracks and all that stuff um, that are going around it, again, are kind of coming in from our, our, our customers and our end users as well too. So um, I think it spans everything um, and it really depends upon the use case for how people are trying to, to work with the data, um, their, how they're trying to build solutions and what they're trying to offer out there. Very cool. It's wild. I mean, uh, and Richard, uh, Rich, Richard's background is in AECO. So I bet you you would have loved to have this information when you were working with some clients, Richard, back in the day. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. This What they do is is revolutionary for, for architects. Um, you know, I, I, I remember when we used to uh, try to uh, go to Google Maps and try to grab a screenshot in those mm -hmm. days and, and try to paste it on a plane and, it, you know, convince the client that their building was sitting in the real world, but it was just really a, a an image uh, from yeah. Google, which, you know, you wasn't really supposed to do, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, but, but now we don't need to do that. We can just bring in real uh, world data from these great uh, facilities and APIs and just get it, get it accurate, you know, and get it, get it precise. Very cool. And actually, uh, it's a great, great segue, actually, to a comment we just got a few minutes ago from Jason. Hi, folks. Nice work on the seismic extension. So you guys uh, actually did work on an extension. Uh, and uh, and tell us a, a little bit about that and how, how that works. I'm going to ask Sean to talk about that one. All right, Sean. Are you, uh, let me see, are you sharing your screen or are we going to stay with? Uh, we'll stay with. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Take we're on. So we built a, <clears throat> a kit extension. So any sort of Omniverse apps you've built on kit can take advantage of it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to install. And it's also now a community extension. So if you load the extension list, you'll see it right there if you search Cesium. And basically what it does is uh, it sort of gives you easy access to these data sets that Dave talked about. So you can easily just click a button and load Cesium World Terrain and then like now that you have that geospatial context, you can see how your design model that might be in USD, how that fits on the globe and and uh, sort of gives you context for, for the project that you're working on. And in addition, Omniverse has all these like amazing ray tracing and sort of like visualization capabilities. So we have like very advanced like shadow studies and other simulations that we can run, uh, which once you have like your design model and then the the surrounding geospatial context, you could really learn a lot from running these simulations. It's wild. Um, yeah, look at all look at all those great, great, very familiar apps uh, working with USD there. Yeah, and we have a lot of uh, Ryan put together a lot of great tutorials to show how to get your data from these software packages into USD and then into Omniverse. And where uh, so Ryan, where'd you put all those tutorials? Is it in Cesium uh, YouTube? A Cesium website, we have a have an extensive learning center, and I think we've got some links to share at the end uh, of, of this uh, of this session. So yeah, that's fantastic. And we just got a comment from Ordinary <laughs> Alan here, great great member of the community. I just found my old home back in Australia via the Cesium online website. Pretty cool. <laughs> Ryan, did you prioritize Australia? <laughs> <Maybe not. laughs> um, that's awesome. So everyone in the chat who's watching, absolutely feel free to post your questions, your comments. We would love to uh, take them live for you here. And if we can't, we might hang out on Discord afterwards for a few minutes, time permitting. Uh, so feel free to uh, post any comments, questions uh, there for during the stream. Um, so very cool. So uh, uh, how much work was involved in, in making the extension? Uh, you know, is it uh, yeah, really so, straightforward? Uh, I'd say it actually took a, a good bit of work to especially since we have pretty strict performance requirements. So we had to just squeeze as much performance as possible. And we're still working on that too. Uh, and then I think just learning, learning. well, to us, like USD was relatively new. And then some of the other APIs we use, like Fabric, were new. So it was mainly a matter of just like learning how all these different technologies work together, how the UI system works in Kit, uh, and really referencing a lot of the documentation that's out there as well as just diving in and like seeing how other extensions work and then just copying the best practices from those. So 
yeah, it was really, I mean, while it was a good amount of work, I think it ultimately took us maybe two or three months to, or maybe even less to get like a result on the screen. So it, it wasn't necessarily as long a cycle as like it took for season for Unreal, which was sort of our first integration. Uh, we were able to use a lot of the existing things we learned in some of the core libraries that we built to just to sort of accelerate the process when we did season for Omniverse. So yeah, that's that's fantastic. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really would love to see uh, members of the community who are watching this uh, live or afterwards on, on the YouTube channel. I would love to see anything you uh, you end up doing with the extension and getting your thoughts on the on the season extension. Really easy to find, obviously, um, but I would love to see. And uh, um, I think it's pretty exciting when you when you have this available to people and uh, just amazing to see what new kind of projects, uh, what new kind of companies uh, can kind of be born and having access to this kind of data and being able to leverage it in this way. Uh, and there you go. Thank you. Big thanks to Amelia in the background, helping us post all the links in, in the chat. Also, I want to thank Julie Steiner uh, for her great help in uh, getting the Cesium team here today. Uh, Julie's amazing to work with on the NVIDIA side of things. Um, very cool. Um, and then you also in uh, in line with this, uh, you released so the, uh, besides the geospatial kind of data that you guys have asked to uh, uh, making available, you also have uh, a demo pack, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a demo pack that shows, and Ryan will go into more detail, but that kind of shows how to actually, or it's like a real world use case of how you might use the extension. And um, I don't want to go into too much depth because Ryan will cover that a, a bit later, but, but yeah, it's really cool. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so we're getting some uh, comments. Out. Welcome to Zia. Always a great, uh, great community member on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. Um, this might be a question uh, more for the NVIDIA team who uh, we'd have to check with afterwards, but I'll put it on the screen in case anyone happens to know. Uh, will GLTF models be uploaded to Ion Ever? Uh, stream, keep your materials to Omniverse or Unreal. Yeah, so I can maybe start to answer this. Great. So, uh, so 3D tiles, which is the format that Dave was talking about, is built on GLTF. So all the content is GLTF. And uh, GLTF does support PBR materials like metallic roughness. And then there's other extensions that are sort of have been in progress. So any anytime you have like PBR content in your GLTF that's inside your 3D tiles, that'll automatically work in Season for Omniverse. So it'll get carried through and converted to the equivalent materials in MDL. Fantastic. That's great. Great question, Ryan. Hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, and great answer, Sean. Um, very cool. Um, and do we want to move into showing off the uh, the demo pack to see what people can actually? Because that always that always a, a big yeah. help for people when they're getting started, right? So you don't have to uh, uh, hunt or try to create some of the stuff that you'll need with these scenes. Yeah, okay. we could jump to that. Cool. Ryan, you up? I am. Okay, so Ryan's going to share his screen. So uh, we're going to switch screens in one second. Uh, and I see Amelia has already posted the demo pack link in the related blog uh, in the chat. So thank you, Amelia. And uh, Ryan, we're ready when you are. Um, and in the meantime, everybody, feel free to post your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we would love to be able to answer them live. And we'll be happy to. I know all of us here are getting ready for uh, uh, GTC. Richard, did you buy your flight ticket yet? No, I've got to do that. That's going to be my uh, evening project to get there. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll check in with you tomorrow to make sure you got a good deal. Uh, OK, cool. Ryan, we can see your screen now. Awesome. So what are we okay. looking at? Looks like, this looks like a familiar app here, a foundational app, a USD composer, which anyone is free to break apart and do what you wish. That's it. So this is USD Composer. Uh, we have uh, the demo pack open. So a bit of background on the demo pack, um, the AECO demo pack. So just for people who don't know, AECO stands for Architecture, Engineering, Construction and Operations. Uh, so the demo pack goal is to produce a best practice, practice example of integrating an architectural design, so building into a geospatial context. Um, why might we want to do that? Well, as Dave mentioned earlier before, it's great to have a fantastic new building design, but if it just exists in white space, it only kind of tells half the story, right? 
So what's crucial with these sorts of projects is not only understanding what this building might look like, but how it's going to impact the surrounding environment, be it visually or be it something like noise or maybe how it impacts traffic or pedestrians, those sorts of things. So being able to place these new designs into a real world context uh, allows the people working on these projects, allows project stakeholders to really understand what those impacts might be through simulations rather than building the wrong design, which is obviously a much uh, more expensive uh, problem once it's done, if it's done in the wrong way. Um, I've got a video here, which I'll just share quickly uh, before we dive into the detail. Let me just open that up. Let me see. Did that the one I have? I might have. Is that the AECO demo pack video? Yeah. Have you got that one there? Yeah, I got it all queued up. Let me play that. Yeah, play let's that. Take, let's take a look at this. Very cool. So this is, uh, well, so all these assets all are in the demo pack? That's right. So this is the demo pack. And we're, what we're really seeing is a proposed design model that's come from some AEC software. Uh, it's a nice shiny building you can see. Wow. And then uh, it's sitting inside two centimeter photogrammetry data, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. Uh, and then also supported by cesium wall terrain in the background. Um, so that's kind of the end result. And what I'll do is I'll dive a bit deeper into how we got to that end result and feel free to chime in with any questions uh, as I go through. Um, so workflow wise, what we want to do when producing one of these projects is firstly start off with our context. We need a project site. So in this particular case, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to replace this building here with a new proposed design, which you saw in the video. Um, we have established our project with this two centimeter photogrammetry data from our good friends at Aerometrics. Basically what they do is they fly helicopters around the city and capture tens of thousands of photos, stitch them together and produce these survey accurate 3D meshes. Those 3D meshes then get output into the 3D tiles open format, which was mentioned earlier. And what that us allows us to do is stream it into Omniverse uh, with the Cesium for Omniverse extension. So this data set on disk is about 25 gigabytes. It's quite dense data once you get down low and it covers a fairly big building footprint. And this is just the San Francisco buildings I'm talking about here, not the, the wider world terrain. So you can understand if you've got 25 gigabytes of data, trying to cram that into your USD as regular mesh at that detail level with those meshes and textures is pretty intense. Um, through streaming with 3D tiles, only a fraction of that comes through to our scene. So if I'm loading a few like this, it might use 100, maybe 200 megabytes to get my initial data down. And then as I fly through the scene, it's progressively loading in the level of detail that's most relevant to me near the camera and lower details further out. What that does is that gives us our context data, which is nice and accurate and allows us to start working on this project site. So the next step, next step is we need to remove the existing building uh, so that we can put the proposed in its place and we don't want them clashing. So we want to be able to remove that building properly. And what we do as part of our workflow is we define our project site. And in this case here, what I'll do is I'll turn off the existing and you can see we've removed that building here. Now I've got a blank slate, a blank slate that's ready to fill in uh, with our proposed design data. And in this particular case, we had uh, Aerometrics physically remove that site from this design model. Uh, but we've also recently released a uh, new tile set clipping feature in our extension, which allows users to remove sections on the fly at runtime, which is great when you don't have access to this source data behind the scenes. Maybe you're using Cesium World Terrain, maybe you're using Google's photorealistic 3D tiles and you can't get in to edit the source data using tile set clipping allows you to define a region and clip out basically like a cookie cutter, remove the existing so you can then start to put your proposed data in. And what we do as part of this workflow as well is also make sure we receive uh, the inside uh, data set so that we can still turn it back on later and begin to compare our proposed building with the existing building that was there. It's really useful for some workflows later on. 
It's amazing. Uh, very, very cool to hear though. You guys are always continually evolving uh, the extension. That's right. And we've got a few more features, which if we get time at the end of the call, we might flash them up on screen and, and, nice. uh, and show you some of the new, new changes to the extension. Okay, so we've got our empty site ready to bring in our design data. Now this project is built up of three separate exports. These are all produced in AEC software packages and brought into Omniverse via USD using the Omniverse uh, connectors to apps like Rhino and 3D Studio Max, those sorts of things. So the first thing we want to do is turn on our assembly site, our base site here. Now, if I click on that so we can show the outline, you'll see what we've done is not only have we produced this new site footprint with the new footpath and the new building pad and, and the grass and those sorts of things, we've also produced, uh, we've also edited the photogrammetry that's immediately around the site. So we've purposely made this site boundary a little bit bigger than the actual curve and channel. And the reason we do this is so that you can make some edits to the roads that directly adjoin your building site because you, know, you might be adding new car parks or a driveway entrance or things like that. So purposefully choosing a project site boundary that's a little bit bigger than your immediate site just gives you that flexibility of being able to edit those integrations into your scene. And you can see that we've also started to use the Omniverse uh, asset libraries to bring in some vegetation, furniture, things like that to start to add some life or add some more visual detail to our environment. It's amazing. Yeah, Actually, I, 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 let me interrupt one question. We've got a good question yeah. that's probably applicable to what you just mentioned. Uh, this is from Ordinary Allen. Do you remove people from the scene, allowing computer generated crowds to be added later? Yeah, so what happens when these um, data sets are captured is because they're capturing uh, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of photos throughout the photogrammetry generation uh, process, a lot of that automatically gets removed as a car might be visible in one photo, but maybe it's not visible in another eight photos of the area. Um, but then Aerometrics as the data provider can also apply post-processing cleanup to those data sets to specifically remove things like cars I or see. for other projects, we've had them remove maybe trees or uh, flatten certain areas. Um, it really uh, it depends on what your project use cases are. And then with the tile set clipping uh, capability as well, whilst you probably wouldn't use that to remove yeah, individual cars, maybe you might use that to clean up a region and, and remove certain content. Very cool. And we had actually an early question I missed from Zia. Uh, it's interesting actually. Uh, do you use USD payloads to alleviate some of the GPU crunching? So in this scene, we've used payloads primarily for the design data uh, to help with that. And it also means that those design data USDs can be open standalone, which can be useful for editing the designs uh, in isolation without having the whole scene running. Amazing. Very cool. Okay. I think that's, I think we're caught up on the questions. Awesome. Cool. So the next payload we'll bring in. Uh, is the base building design. And this one has come from, uh, from Rhino. And uh, the important thing to note uh, here is these designs are accurately georeferenced to the globe. So what we're not doing is we're not dragging these building ins and then positioning them by eye, which you know is a valid workflow if you're wanting to produce some artistic impressions and those sorts of things. But what we want to do is strive to make sure the stuff looks great, but is also accurate in its positioning because that's going to enable us to perform workflows downstream, like shadow analysis, sightline analysis, and things like that. If we want to rely on those sorts of uh, outputs, we need to know that our building has been positioned into the city in the correct location. Uh, we've got a number of tutorials uh, on our website for the different AEC packages, which step through how to accurately locate those buildings within the cesium globe um, so it's a really useful resource for for doing that and if you set up your project like that at the beginning it means that you're not going to get questions from stakeholders downstream as to why is this not accurate you know you can rely on the scene setup the last one we'll bring in is the facade of the building which is generated in grasshopper i believe and you see that's got some nice uh, reflective glass materials and things like that. 
So once we've got all these things together, we've now got the start of our, uh, our project, our scene or our digital twin, which we can then use to perform a bunch of different workflows. Now, the last thing I wanted to jump into um, the scene setup is we've used the awesome variance capability inside of uh, USD uh, to help us control different design options in the scene. I think this is going to be a really powerful tool for these sorts of projects moving forward where you might start out with one building design, but then you end up with the next building design and then a next building design and then a variant of that design. And suddenly you've got a whole bunch of different designs of which they all might be valid. And what you'll find is stakeholders might want to compare those different designs to each other and to existing. When you're managing content, uh, 3D content like this in complex scenes, you don't want to be clicking on and off 20 different layers every time you need to jump between different configurations. So with variants, it's a simple setup in, in the demo pack that can obviously get much more complicated where we can use a variant just to swap very quickly between the existing and the design. So you'll see now we've popped our old building back in and that starts to become super useful for when we want to start presenting these projects to stakeholders and they ask the question of how is it different from what's already there with a single click you can just jump back very cool into the That's existing awesome. check it out yeah great. very very useful saves clicking a whole bunch of uh, buttons to try and control visibility of lots of different components and layers and yeah you could extend that to have multiple design options or even subsets of your design perhaps there's a version of the design that has uh, concrete floor treatment and then the version of the design that has a timber floor treatment or uh, different layouts, those sorts of things. But it's a very, very powerful tool. Very cool. And we had a, a question here. I think we answered this a little bit earlier, but maybe we can dive into a little bit more. Um, how many cities are captured? Uh, how does one augment missing elements? Yeah. So the data can be uh, is available from lots of different locations. Uh, there's global data sets such as Google's photorealistic 3D tiles, which cover I think two and a half thousand cities off the top yeah. of my head. Wow! Uh, yeah. With 3D wow. 3D data, it's pretty extensive. Uh, then there mm -hmm. can be bespoke data captures such as this one, uh, where a specific city or a specific project region has been captured. And that's where you'll engage a company like Aerometrics for them to capture a, a site on spec. And there's other suppliers which provide data sets that you can purchase off the shelf and things like that. So the data is quite, um, there's lots of different sources that you can pick and choose for your projects. Uh, but the great thing now is we're seeing that these data sets are becoming easy to access more off the shelf so that you don't need to always commission a capture for a project. There might be something already out there for you to get started. And then as the project matures, perhaps you need to capture a, a more detailed area uh, to suit your use cases. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot more too with the capture is maybe not a firm, but somebody flies a drone. Right, so they go up and they do a drone capture over a particular area and they're able to bring that content in as well too so um it's the size of the site and the size of what they're trying to do um, there's lots of options and lots of ways to get the data and then we're helping make it easier to actually use the data it's amazing I, and you know uh captain's here hey captain he posted a nice comment earlier uh how useful the sun calculation is um yeah i can imagine that's uh that's super helpful <laughs> Very good segue too. That's what I was about to jump into. All right. Cool. So we've got our scene it's set up. It's positioned accurately. It's starting to look nice. Lots of different things we can now do with this uh, this uh, this setup. Obviously, we can produce our visualizations. We can produce some nice renders. Uh, we can produce some nice videos and things like that. Uh, and that's where I think we can jump down to different areas like this and start to capture what it might look like from a balcony looking down the city street. And I'll just adjust the time of day. So we've got some nicer lighting here. Perhaps jump into RTX Interactive to really make that light pop. And that's the power I think with, I'm, I'm enjoying with uh, Omniverse and USD Composer is the rendering that kind of just happens automatically uh, through things like RTX Interactive. There's less time spent uh, 
on materials and render settings, things like that, kind of just works or it gets you a, a great result with minimal effort, uh, which is which is awesome, especially at the early stages of project where you're maybe not quite at the point of producing the high quality, slick, finished brochure type renders, but you want to produce content very quickly to send out to your stakeholders to check out you know, what this latest design looks like. So kind of iteration, which becomes really easy with visualizations, videos, imagery, and things like that. Totally. And we actually have our resident expert on rendering here, Richard. So if anyone needs any help in that area, Richard's always available. No, he's doing a great job. It looks great. Yeah. No pressure, Ryan. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> it looks wonderful. You can also see as we uh, integrate, we've got our photogrammetry data down here providing our you know, mid ground and, and foreground content. This is in world terrain in the background here gives us the uh, the horizon line of what that looks like across the bay. So we've not only got our immediate context, but yeah, we've, we've got the world in there. That is wild. Super awesome for sight lines. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump up into our sun study position. Now, a common uh, activity with assessing these sorts of buildings, especially in a, a city type context, is how does this building uh, impact or what are this building's shadow impacts? So the Sun Study extension, which comes with uh, USD Composer, can be enabled in the extensions window, uh, allows us to easily answer those questions. So because our scene is set up accurately from a bloke point of view in terms of defining a latitude and longitude for our USD, that can feed into the Sun Study tool. And that location means that for this particular time of day, so 1.30 p.m., 30th of June, 2021, we now have accurate shadow rendering. That's for, wild. Yeah, very, very cool. And using the variant presenter to jump back between existing and design means we can now understand what shadows are being contributed by the new building, which is super important when you have planning codes that might say, no overshadowing on public spaces at a certain time of day, a certain time of year. It's a very common type of constraint for these sorts of things. So even before you produce your more detailed design inside of uh, you know, Revit or Rhino or whatever architectural package you're using, you can even jump into a scene like this and start to drop down some primitive shapes like boxes in the project site that match different building dimensions and use them to quickly test out different shadow scenarios. What does a 10 story building do compared to a 12 story building? So you start to unlock these most pre-designed type activities within this environment very easily, uh, which, you know, that could have been quite a complex cast uh, before these sorts of data sets and systems were available. That's amazing. We got a nice, nice comment here from uh, Gregory. Thank you for sharing really amazing job as a tech driven real estate startup. I'm trying to implement this. I'm amazed about what you guys did. Very true. Awesome. And then the other workflow that is quite useful, again, with these contextual data sets that are available is being able to start to assess sight lines of the proposed design. So we can see the proposed design is sitting here on the horizon. We can now basically jump to anywhere in the city especially if there's key locations where there may be some planning codes that state that the building uh, envelope can't impact visibility to a certain key landmark or something like that. So I could jump down to these locations and test out what the building looks like from these areas and see how much of the proposed design is contributing or impacting on site lines uh, in the distance. So I can see our proposed design building down here. We can quite clearly understand the new addition to the skyline based on that. That's amazing. Uh, you know, we have actually a really interesting question too. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, is it possible to, uh, to leverage VR? Have you guys- oh, yeah, that, was, that, that was my next uh, next point. So, wow, man. Uh, yeah. 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 Our audience says that it's- uh, Eat up left and right. You, you're taking yeah. away all his, all his points, you know? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, it's it's great. Um, I don't have a VR uh, example set up, but uh, now that we've got these projects set up in USD, we can definitely start to use VR and XR for a variety of different use cases. Um, 
One, it can simply just be to experience the building in VR and get a sense of how it fits in the space and how it feels and things like that. Um, but moving on from that, you can then start to do some really interesting exercises around maybe training or familiarization. Um, I've worked on projects in the past that have utilized VR for uh, testing out the maintenance uh, capabilities of a building. What is it actually going to be like to clean the windows in the foyer at this location, for example, being able to wow. go into the VR and simulate how does machinery fit in this space? Like, can I get the, the scissor lift in this area? Is it going to make sense? Um, another one that works really well with context data is understanding what the pedestrian experience might be like coming to and from uh, a location. You know, think about designing a new stadium or, or a new underground rail station or something like that, being able to walk around the city in VR and walk from the exit of the subway to the stadium in this 3D city context. Those sorts of workflows start to become uh, unlocked and are quite powerful in VR because you get that human level experience. Amazing. Very cool. Thanks for the great question uh, and answer. Uh, very cool. Uh, let me see. A great, great question actually from Zia here. What about traffic? And uh, I'm sure that's a big part of people's work in this area. Yeah, it's quite quite common, and I think what we're seeing, at least what I'm observing in the the Omniverse uh, and the USD ecosystem, is there's some specialist tools out there in the market that that do that sort of thing. And as we see them start to adopt USD, those sorts of connections will begin to become available inside of Omniverse. So now we've built our digital twin, being able to export it out as USD into those specialist packages, perform a simulation, whether it's traffic, whether it's pedestrians, whether it's noise or wind analysis, things like that, and bring that back into Omniverse, start to become, those workflows start to become available. Well, we, we had a we had our crowd sim uh, vendor on a few weeks ago, didn't we? So that would be perfect for that. Yeah, Reillusion. Uh, yeah, Reillusion is, that's where they they uh, specialize. They can come in and populate that with a dynamic, you know, AI crowd and simulate all kinds of interaction. Very cool. I wonder if they're working on a, uh, a traffic traffic sim. That'd be pretty neat. For me, for me, I, I, get I, get, I get excited about the reflections in the windows. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm the I, I'm the I'm the guy that likes the pretty pictures, and the fact that you can see the actual reflections in the windows and with the great thing with the time of day i used to do some real estate renderings and everybody wanted to know when do i get my sunset i mean that's a serious question like when people pick their apartment in a building they want to know what's my view when do i get the sunset when do i get the sunrise um and they would actually pick their apartment based on based on knowing that uh, that sun study um, and so it's, it's great the way you can scrub through and see exactly when the sun hits that building and, and, and the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of effects you get from it. Yeah. We've had a lot of, we've had some of our partners on the real estate side, build those things where you can, like, like I go into a, into an apartment, what does it actually look like now? Like, what is my view from my balcony, um, with the real world context and then all of those things too, so they can pick and choose and, and have that visualization without actually having to go there or to, to kind of get a, see, a sense of what it would actually be like. It's been pretty cool to see that. That's a, uh, yeah, it's a good point, actually. So if people want to be inspired uh, by some of the work that your customers or partners are doing, uh, where's the play, best place to catch all that stuff? On the Cesium website or someplace else? Yeah, I mean, I think the Cesium website's a great spot. Um, we have a pretty active blog post on our Cesium website that's got a lot of user stories, um, really inspirational stuff um, with this with using omniverse with using unreal with um uh, js and some of the other things as well too so that's a great place to start um would be our, our our website and then our blog posts that are on the website there very cool a nice a nice testimonial from uh, sirens there i just put on the screen a second ago it's already been fooling around with cesium it's very cool i uh, i agree with you sirens um but look at that look at that why don't you just print that and frame it <laughs> oh, yeah. Like a postcard now. Nice. Oh wow, that's crazy. That's amazing. I have to ask, what, what do you, what do you, what do you have for hardware on this, Ryan? What do you got? What's, what kind of rig do you got there in Australia? So the I'm just on a modest uh, 
Dell XPS 15, but I do have an uh, A6000 plugged into an external enclosure. So that's providing a bit of the, the GPU grunt. But the rest of the PC is fairly, fairly modest i7. That's awesome. That's great. Look at that. That's just, that's just mind blowing. And uh, you know, I should also say that it doesn't have to be used for architecture. I know a lot of people that would use this for creative purposes too. You know, like this movie makers that could have some kind of downtown drama going on. If you want to do a, you know, a, some kind of a Godzilla takeoff, I'm sure you could uh, destroy New York or something. You know, it doesn't have to always be uh, architecture. There's a lot of uses just to having a really nice representation of your favorite city, whatever, wherever that may be for you, you know? Right. We had, I think there was a, uh, when we did the go, the Google photorealistic 3d tiles release, uh, over the summer, um, which kind of unlocked all of these, as Ryan said, I think 2,500 cities in this 3d environment. I remember one of the clips that actually had Godzilla kind of walking around with inside of the city and, and being able to do that stuff. Um, flight simulators is another great example too. Oh yeah. To do that and fly around. Um, Red Bull actually used some of this for, uh, they had a, you know, one of their extreme events where you, they had hang gliders, so you could you could see they were tracking the location of the hang gliders, but then you could see them in context um, with the terrain and all that stuff around it, and then actually almost like a VR thing go into what they're actually seeing with inside the cockpit of the hang gliders and stuff, which is, it's all that stuff is really cool. It kind of connects um, and just kind of brings it home a little bit more each time. It's awesome. Um, speaking of awesome, we got this awesome question here, actually, from uh, Gregory. Once you've created the scene, is it possible to access from a web browser to share with people, or is it only accessible in the composer? So obviously, uh, USD Presenter is a great, uh, great app. Uh, you can leverage that. I don't know if Cesium, you want to add to that? Yeah, so actually, that's a good point. Uh, USD Presenter, we've produced a tutorial uh, for integrating our extension with USD Presenter. So once you've produced a scene like this inside of Composer, bringing that into Presenter and still having the, the Cesium data string through is, is a workflow that's possible. Uh, and then, yeah, in terms of uh, sharing across the web, uh, any system that uh, enables you to do GPU type streaming uh, is, is something that you can look at. And uh, Cesium's foundations as well uh, came from a JavaScript library for streaming this sort of data into web browsers. So there's different workflows there for bringing this sort of data across to, to different locations. Um, and I guess that's one of the great things with USD as well. Uh, if you have specific use cases where maybe you need to bring it into a, a, a game engine to produce a game type experience or something like that using USD and bringing uh, this content into something like Unreal or Unity is also possible as we've got extensions in those those platforms as well. And remember, you can stream anytime from any uh, USD composer to any uh, IP using the WebRTC platform. So we have a we have an extension called WebRTC that will, will live stream anything in, in composer out of your viewport to a, a standard web IP. Um, and then you can uh, you can leverage that platform to, to share it on other computers. So for instance, if you wanted to simply share your viewport in real time without necessarily using a third party app, we have that built in, it's called WebRTC. You can enable that and then it will give you a little IP and uh, you can send that out to clients or other computers across the web. That's a great point, great point. Uh, lots of great options there. Um, another great, speaking of options, we got a question from uh, Jeffrey here. Are there options for customizing the EPSG georeference code when importing 3D geometry? Good question. Uh, if you check out the workflows, um, the AEC workflows on the CCM website, um, they go into the specific details of how you might bring data from one EPSG code. Uh, say a projected coordinate system, which is where AEC data tends to live, into the WGS84 globe that Cesium simulates inside of Omniverse. So yeah, take a look at those articles. Each one basically talks through the workflow of going from one coordinate system to another. Uh, really easy website to remember for the Cesium content. Just go to cesium.com. Uh, 
There you go. So good. We put it on there twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, very cool. And, and uh, I think that's great advice to check out the blog series. Um, I think there's a lot that can be learned from other people's projects. Uh, so you don't have to start from scratch when you're doing your project. Take a look and see what some other people are doing and, and what learnings you can grab from that. So that blog seems like a great resource to do that. Um, here's a trivia question, I guess. I don't know if someone here can answer from Cesium. How did the team choose the name Cesium? Is there a backstory there? Probably. We can uh, leave so it as can... a mystery. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so Cesium, the element, is used in atomic clocks. And initially, Cesium was very focused on time dynamic data. So it was just kind of a nice sort of fit. Initially, Cesium was actually called Geoscope, like way, way long ago. But thankfully, we went with a, a bit of a better name. Very cool. I'm impressed that you got the domain.com. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you have a lot of, do you have a lot of scientists coming to your site and be like, Hey, <laughs> um, very cool. Uh, we're going to put the, uh, that training link, uh, it's in the chat, but just for everyone watching this afterwards, put this on the screen for everybody. Uh, let me actually think there's a better website here for typing. Um, tzm.com slash learn slash omniverse. Right. Um, and there is some great blog posts here. I'll put this on the screen again. Uh, big thank you to Amelia for helping in the background. Um, and I think your colleague, Shazan, is also helping. Uh, thank you very much for helping in the background with some of these questions. Great questions uh, from the chat. So thank you, everybody, for participating in this. This is uh, fantastic information. Great show and tell all around. Um, so what's, uh, what's next? Uh, obviously, you're, you're actively continuing to evolve the extension, which is amazing. Um, it seems like you know, open USD, uh, there's no stopping it now. It's a, a alliance with open USD and, um, uh, Apple's, um, uh, participation now as a, as a, as a member of alliance with open USD, uh, along with Adobe and Autodesk and video and Pixar, um, you know, there's obviously no stopping what's, uh, what's happening now in the industries and, um, uh, quick adoption of open USD kind of traveling fast. Uh, so it's great to see more and more apps probably will be able to leverage its workflow. Um, what, what's next on the radar for you guys? If you're allowed to say, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are talking about anything at GTC. We have to hold off on, but uh, no. I mean, I think it, one is. I think from the tool set perspective, it's just adding more more feature functionality into into the tool set. So we just released uh, clipping uh, with inside of Omniverse, and we do tile set clipping for a lot of that. Um, there's some um, ex, um, material you can actually stylize um, some of the scenes based upon the material with inside of the tile sets now too. So um, being able to kind of stylize based upon metadata uh, with inside of um, with inside of Omniverse, um, improvement for glow bankers, so securing the location and, and placing objects and making sure they stay in the right spot with inside of there. So there's like some of that care and feeding that's going in with inside a composer, and then the, the larger USD is you know we're trying to we're looking at ways to um, to integrate USD with inside of Cesium Ion. So maybe you can just upload a USD file um, and doing some integration related to that. Um, Sean, I don't know if there's anything more um, larger picture that you want to, uh, we could we could share there. Yeah, I mean, I think the rest would be just like trying to improve just the integration with AEC workflows. So Ryan showed a bunch of stuff, but like we could take it a lot further as well. So thinking about how to get design data into Omniverse efficiently. Yeah. And as you mentioned, as the USD community starts to grow and more people start to use it and adopt it, it's like right, there's going to be new use cases that pop up. Um, so I think one of the things that we also encourage too is, you know, community of users that are out there. I mean, season is very much community focused. Like if there are ideas or different ways of doing things or questions or different directions you could take it, um, our community forum is a great place to start putting those things in. We're constantly watching that. So you get another link to share at community.season.com where people can, um, suggest ideas or have questions about specific things. It's a great place to go for that as well too. Um, all of us are, are monitoring that and can respond to those things too. So, right, that's cool. awesome. Sorry, I was trying to trying to type really fast so I can get in the chat. But Amelia, maybe you can help with that. It's community.cesium.com if you guys missed it. Um, so we'll uh, we'll get that in the chat in a second. Uh, amazing. Um, uh, so th thank you guys so much for presenting this. Uh, before we go, maybe I'll I'll um, uh, if you have any last questions, please post them in the chat. Um, I'm going to just go over a couple of quick things before we uh, we give our final notes here on this fantastic uh, 
topic uh, with the cesium team. Uh, we have uh, some kind of cool stuff that we've been posting on the announcements area of the forum. Uh, so those who are uh, not a member of the forum, it's worth checking out once in a while uh, because we do utilize the announcements area for, for cool stuff. Um, let me see if I could share my screen here. Uh, but most recently, there's been a, um, a developer uh, survey that has been made available. So I'm just going to go down here to uh, documentation survey, I should say. So this is, oh, look at that picture there, that guy. Um, this is the documentation survey that is uh, expires. You have until February 9th. So this is super critical for anyone out there who is uh, leveraging Omniverse. Uh, we would love your feedback uh, on how to improve our documentation. So um, some of you veterans out there may have some great suggestions that can help us ramp up new developers. Um, and we would love to hear from you. So that uh, that's a fantastic opportunity. It only takes a few minutes, um, but you can have a big impact on the next generation or the, the current generation of developers that are leveraging OpenUSD by helping us with uh, with that uh, that survey. Um, and then we also posted recently uh, what do we have here a call out if you have if you have some creative magic that you'd like to share with the world. Uh, my colleague Amelia posted this the other day. We would love uh, your video clip uh, to potentially include in the GTC keynote that Jensen's going to be giving in just a few weeks at GTC. So go to the forums area. We'll post it in the, in the chat and you can read this. But we would love um, we would love to see your work in that keynote sizzle reel. Um, it's uh, it's I think it's the most inspiring thing we produce every year. Uh, a lot of a lot of people from across the world participate. I would love to see you work in there from the community. Um, and uh, I think images are okay too, uh, but we definitely uh, definitely want to want to see any videos that you guys might have as well. Um, and then finally, we have the GTC sessions that are broken down by topic. Uh, again, early bird expires at eleven fifty nine p.m. sharp Pacific today. Uh, so uh, feel free to come check out this post uh, uh, if you need more more inspiration to go to GTC. We have. All the sessions broken down by topic. Uh, of course, OpenUSD is a huge topic today on this live stream and others. Uh, we have a whole slew of sessions revolving on OpenUSD. Synthetic gen data generation, or as I like to call it, SDG. Also, a bunch of sessions around that. Industrial digitalization. Um, and, of course, digital twins, uh, creators. Uh, uh, lots of just amazing content going to be happening. So we've broken it down for you as much as we could there. Uh, so people check that out and make your your registration process uh, a little easier. Um, that's it for the GTC pitch for today. I think um, what I'd like to do is any closing comments that we've got from the season team or Richard, any of your, your final thoughts on uh, on what we looked at today? Well, I, I think we should inspire the community to go, let's say, go, go play with it and capture your own city. Uh, and, you know, maybe we can view some of these submissions later, you know, see what people can do with the tool both for creative work and AC work and, you know, let, get, get inspired by these uh, amazing data sets that you can just get for free. So. Yeah, That's absolutely. I mean, I think we'd, we'd encourage to, you know, it's all, a lot of it is for free. There's trial stuff, seizing the ION account, you can sign up for free and start streaming stuff into um, some of the global content that's out there um, and start building stuff up. I mean, it's always great to be inspired by what people pull together um, and uh, create on their own with our own point of views and, um, you know, different problems that they're trying to solve. So that would be, yeah, it'd be awesome. And I, again, thanks, Edmar, for, for having us on here today. It's been awesome. I have to say it's absolutely our pleasure and honor. Anytime uh, your team wants to come back and share any new work you're doing in Extension or, uh, or if you want to share new workflows with new uh, apps in the ecosystem that are leveraging OpenUSD that open up new doors for people, love to have you back. Uh, We've all done a really fantastic job of explaining everything, giving a nice overview, and then also taking a really nice deep dive, Ryan. I think that was wonderful to see. Uh, and, and Sean as well, I think great, great work on the uh, the extension. Um, really, really just, you know, kudos to all of you for, for making this available to so many people now uh, that just would did not have ac did not have access to this just a, a short time ago. So I can't wait to see what more people in the community are going to be doing with these, uh, this kind of data and their projects. So, um, Really fantastic. Thank you all for coming. I think next week uh, we're going to have uh, some members of the community 
uh, including Matthew Schwartz and Tanya Langer. We're going to be we're going to be showing off some uh, Rhino workflows. Rhino just released a pretty big update, Rhino 8. Uh, so we're going to take a look at uh, what some people are doing uh, with their uh, new support of OpenUSD. Super exciting. Um, and uh, that's going to be this week, this time. And then uh, we're going to update a couple other um, live streams that are happening on our Ed event page. So feel free to check that out for more. Um, I think we've we've answered most of the questions. So if if anyone's got any uh, any final questions in the community, uh, I'm going to hop over to Discord for a minute. Season team, you're invited to come out. Uh, Ryan, I know you probably need to get some more coffee in your blood. Uh, what's, <laughs> thank you for getting up so early. Very impressive. Um, yeah, thank thank you guys all much just for, for for spending time with us today, and thank you for the community for the great questions and and chat. Really had a fun time. We will. Thanks, guys. We will see. I'll, I'll, anyone who is in the computer anyway, watching, you want to hop over to Discord, feel free to hop on to Discord. Go ahead, Ryan. Were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, and we will go head over to Discord. There's a, a channel on the Omniverse Discord called Community Voice, or I think, uh, yeah, uh, Voice Room 1, I think. Uh, we will be there. Uh, so feel free to come there if you need to get your question answered. And uh, otherwise, we will see you uh, on the forums and on Discord or in our next live stream. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks so.